taking your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 26 this morning. Acts chapter 26, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Acts for just over two, almost two years now, and uh, we're coming down last couple weeks, and then we'll move on to something next. We'll announce when we get that all prepped. Acts 26, we're going to look at a, a we're going to start, There's, we're going to look at 20, uh, most of the chapter, uh, not all the chapter, but we're going to start with one verse which we will actually not get to till later in it. It's a verse that has been used many times. It's a great verse. Uh, probably, uh, I've heard it preached before, doesn't mean exactly what sometimes I've heard it preached. Uh, so we're going to look at the scripture today. Here's what I want to speak on. My title of the message this morning is God's greatest work. Now, I have to be honest, you've got to be careful using that term, God's greatest, that definition. But let me explain what I mean by that. My uh, subtitle of the message today is the testimony of a changed life, the testimony of a changed life. In this section of the book of Acts, we walk through, um, really, Paul's in prison. He's in some kind of heavy prison, and when he was under Felix, not necessarily so. Festus comes in, and they really don't know what to do with this guy. They don't just want to let him go, because then the Jewish people were uproar, but they also know if they let him go, the Jewish people are going to kill him. So there's all of this conflict as to what to do with this guy, Paul. So for a few years now, he's just been kind of in limbo. In this process, we read more than once, Paul gets to give his testimony to people in leadership. Well, this guy Festus, this king, or Agrippa, this king comes in, and now all of a sudden, Paul gets a chance to preach. It's what God told him he would do. He's preaching to a king. And so he starts off, and there's a verse in here that the king references But one of the things Paul does is Paul, in his argument, instead of really defending himself in this chapter, he just gives his testimony. And I look at this, I'm like, you know, we've preached on this idea at least twice over the book of Acts. So I thought, where do we go with this? And so what I want to do is I'm going to pull out five principles today about the testimony from Paul. One, the true testimony of a transformed life. This is a great truth to see his testimony and what a transformed life in Christ looks like. But two, second principle is this. I hope you get how powerful your testimony is in the gospel. A lot of times people say, I don't know have all the answers. I really don't know what to say. You know you don't have to have all the answers. As a matter of fact, most people you might invite to church or witness to aren't really overly concerned with your knowledge of theology. You know what they're looking for? Whether that theology is real to you. And your testimony is that key. So I'm hoping those two things. For many of us, this is going to be a reminder of how God brought us to salvation. But let's start, just starting off with verse number, um, i got to find the, I think it's verse 28. Verse number 28, King Agrippa says, the Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, we'll look a little bit in detail what that specifically is stating, but let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. I didn't want to read all 32 verses up front, so let's just start with the word of prayer. We love you, Father. We're grateful for the privilege we have to study your word this morning. I pray, Lord, you fill me with your spirit, that I might say only what you want, nothing more, nothing less. Somehow would you use my feeble words as an opportunity to encourage those here today, those watching Father, may you work through me. Uh, You've promised it is through the fullness of the preaching you will confound the wise. And we pray, Father, you will use these truths through this preacher today somehow to exalt the name of Jesus. We ask this in his name and for your sake. Amen. You know, as we study the life of Paul, no doubt one of the greatest aspects of his life is his change from a persecutor to a passionate preacher. At first, This was thought to have been a massive hindrance to the church. Everybody was afraid of Paul. He was a persecutor. So when he came and claimed he was saved, they all thought it was a Trojan horse, as it were. And they would tell him where all the churches were, and then he would shut them all down. And valid reason to believe that. And so it took people like Barnabas and others to convince the church that this man was legitimate and ended up taking him through all of the persecution, what he went through to be one of the greatest founding fathers of what we call the modern church age. This became later, this thing that was a hindrance to the church later became one of his greatest tools in preaching. Because he didn't grow up in church and tell everybody would like him. He says, I am who I am because of the grace of God. And that's really what the world needs to see. The world doesn't need to see, be like us. Because I hope we all realize we don't want more people to be like us, do we? No, I'm glad we all said no on that one, all right? I hope we realize none of us 
are perfect. Actually, I, I was going to say this when I started, but I want you to, just a thought, I won't give any details, but t- when you think about it throughout the week, just even if you just generically pray for our missionaries and church planners and things of that nature, um, this week I was in touch a little bit with one of them, and he's just had an absolutely miserable week. True satanic attack. I can't go any deep more detail than that. Uh, I just say, I won't even give you his name, but pray. Uh, just pray for the people who sometimes you don't think about. You may not know what other people are going through, especially missionaries and, and pastors and evangelists. Satan wants to destroy them. But as I, as I was thinking about that and chatting with this gentleman this week, one of the thoughts came through my mind. You know, we, we as Christians can find a lot of things to fight about, can't we? They got real quiet there, didn't it? <laughs> we can. We have a lot of differences. And I'm not saying we should. Please don't get me wrong here. I'm just saying a human nature, it's easier to find something wrong with somebody than it is to find something right. Can I, when I, Brother McKenna and I came in, he, he came in, he made the comment, great day to be in church. And I was thinking about that. One of the things I love about church is if we allow it to, it's one hour we can set aside all the world and just look to Jesus and sing his praises and all those things. When I look at that, that's really should be our goal and our focus is to look to him. By the way, if we can just keep our eyes on Jesus, a lot of these other battles just disappear. They really do. But when I, when I look at this, his absolute life change should be an encouragement to us and should be something the world sees is God's grace no matter what. So today I want to take five points and go through the testimony that Paul gives Agrippa as he uses this time to give the gospel, not to defend himself. So what I'm going to do, it won't take as long. I know I usually do three points over 40 minutes, so I promise you it it will not add more time. So five thoughts going, just walking through his testimony. The first thing we're going to talk about is his life before Christ. His life before Christ. I'm going to read the first 12 verses of Acts 26, verse number 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand, and answered for him. So, by the way, stretching forth the hand was a sign of respect to the person he was speaking to. Paul understood the custom. Then Paul gets stretched for verse 2. And I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to answer me or hear me patiently. Here's what he says in that phrase. Just hold on, I'm going to take a while, all right? I'm a, I'm a, he's a Baptist preacher, he's going to take a while. He said, just give me your ear and be patient, verse 4. My manner of life and my youth, which was at the first uh, among my own nation of Jerusalem, known of all the Jews, verse 5, which knew me from the beginning. If they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived the Pharisee, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of, our, of God unto our fathers. Unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God would raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He's talking about when he was the persecutor, which things I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly and mad against them. I persecuted them unto even strange cities, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. So we see the beginning that Paul talks about who he was as the persecutor. He said, I was the one. You remember, we went back to the beginning of Acts, there's the first martyr named Stephen. Now, the name Paul wasn't there because his name was changed, but at that day when Stephen was martyred, Paul was one of the voices that stated he should be martyred, and as they were throwing stones at him, he held the coats of the men, which means he was in a place of authority as he stood overseeing the the persecution of the church. Now, you think about it. If he had enough authority to kill somebody just because, it would explain why people were afraid of this man. Let's look at a a couple things about his life before Christ. Number one, he knew a lot about God in the Bible. He knew a lot about God in the Bible. See, Paul was a Pharisee. Do you know that to be a Pharisee, he would have had to memorize the first five books of the Bible in Hebrew. Now, picture this. Can you imagine memorizing Leviticus in English? He did it in Hebrew. 
When I took Hebrew, I had to take Hebrew in grad school. You know one thing I learned? It's hard to read to Leviticus in Hebrew. I mean, give me Genesis. Give me Job. That's not a problem. Leviticus, he memorized all of these in Hebrew. He knew more about the first five books of the Bible, which means about the coming Messiah and all of this. He knew a lot about the Bible. But instead of letting the Bible transform him, he had an opinion that he adapted to the Bible. He did not see the truth for what it was, too. He had a great passion for what he believed. He believed in what the Pharisees and the Judea, Judaism of the day believed so much that he was willing to hunt down anyone who would be a threat to the truth. He imprisoned men and women. He persecuted families and churches. He stood and watched people martyred for their belief. Why? Because he was passionate. He was extremely passionate because he believed that what he was taught and what he grew up on was true and that, that Jesus was not the Messiah and that this new church arriving was only going to be an apostate church that was just going to draw people away from the truth. And by the way, he had been taught this, so he was just following what he had been taught. It's very important that we recognize we should never, ever follow or have our beliefs based upon the beliefs of a church or a pastor. If you ever say, the reason I believe I'm going to heaven is my pastor said so, uh, I think you and I can talk. I'd love to show you what the Bible says about it. I hope what we understand is this. Our foundation, our belief system should never be based upon a man. Because what happens if that man decides to move and there's another one comes in and his opinion's different? Your foundation should be on the Bible. Now, Lord willing, there will always be someone standing behind her who teaches the Bible. So you can listen to him, not because of his opinion, but because of the Bible. I want you to think of something. We all come from different backgrounds, with different cultures, and the different battles and scars that define us. My knowledge, my family, my background, my understanding of truth is empty if I do not place all of that in Christ. One of the things that God called a mystery, why he called the church a mystery, was it was one place where from all walks, all backgrounds, all different beliefs, whether you grew up in church, whether you just walked through that door, as of Scripture, whether you were the prodigal son who just walked through the door, the, uh, the older son who's been there forever but is still not right with God, whoever it is, whether it's your first time walking through that door, this mystery is a place where we all come together because the Christ is that center focus. It's not on a denomination or a church. It's Christ is that center focus. And Paul proves that, that he was able to come as somebody that was the greatest enemy of the church and became the greatest advocate for the church. Let's look at number two, his confrontation from Christ. We see his life before Christ. Let's look at his confrontation from Christ. I'm going to be in verse number 13, Acts 26, verse 13. The Bible says, at midday, O king, I saw the way, in the way, a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. You know, what happens is he's on what we know as the road to Damascus. He's heading to Damascus with a letter from the chief priest with the freedom to persecute as drastically as he wants believers that he believes have run away from Jerusalem to the city of Damascus. So he's down there with the goal of clearing them out. And as he's going, surrounded by his security, his army that is going to fulfill his word, this bright light comes. These soldiers saw it, but they never heard a voice. He goes blind as he is now face to face with Jesus. This is one of the reasons we believe that he was an apostle, as he saw Jesus face to face. And they have this conversation. Jesus finally stops him and says, it's enough, just stop. Now, he wasn't stopping Saul at that time, Saul, because of persecution. He wasn't stopping him because of what he was going to do. You know why Jesus stopped Saul at this point? He says, I've been trying to tell you how much you need me. You won't listen, so fine, just stop. Don't you wish for the people you were praying for to get saved that God would just show up in a bright light and say, it's me, believe? Wouldn't, don't you think that would be a lot easier? I'm telling you. There are some people I wish you, I don't believe it. Man, I wish God would say, oh, and all of a sudden, they believe. All right? My problem is we'd have all those experiences and a thousand more religions that would come off of that. But Paul stood there fully realizing. Now, he didn't believe because he was face-to-face -face with Jesus. 
Let me explain a couple of things that help us understand what's really going on here. Let's look at the timing, timing of the confrontation. He was on his way to go against Jesus. Paul, Jesus confronts Paul while he was working against him. This was surely the last place Paul ever thought that Jesus would stop him. See, God works in his own timing. One, to help us recognize salvation. Two, when we're going the wrong way as Christians and God wants us to turn around, there are, you know, there are days that it would have been easier, God, if you had just done that in church. This is not a really good time for you to convict me, God. You know, we've all been there. You know, Lord, you just told me in my devotions, you know, if you told me in church, you know, maybe I'm listening to a podcast or something, but this is awkward. You say, what position? Whatever it was, the last time God awkwardly confronted you, you're not talking about, where God just came and said, listen, this isn't the right direction, or maybe salvation, where God just clearly told you, this is the truth. Maybe some of you remember the day that God opened your eyes that you needed salvation. And you look at the surroundings, and what you remember is all the things that God did up to that point. If you weren't sure what was going on, we call it the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But by the time it finally became all clear, it was the perfect timing, because it was God's timing. But also, not only do we see the timing, we see the truth. I want you to um, see an interesting section. Verse number 14 says, And when they were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speak unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, that is an old farming phrase. What does it mean, and why is Paul saying this? And this, to me, is one of the most important aspects of Paul's conversion. So he says, why is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? It's a farming tool. When the farmers were moving animals, uh, all kinds of different animals, from mules to just stubborn animals, they would use these pricks. Sometimes they would just hit them with the prick. Sometimes um, the, thing, the, the farming tool they were towing the animals would kick against them and break them. And so farmers would put pricks, sharp objects, up against the pole that they would kick. And so when the animal would kick back, he would feel the sharp object and say, I'm not doing that again. And every time, in stubborn, I don't want to farm, I don't want to do this, I want to go eat, and the far, he would kick against it, he would get hit with the prick. His foot would hit the prick. And so the animal would go back, okay, stop. So Paul understood that, or Saul at the time. Here's what Jesus is saying. This entire time, Saul, you have been persecuting me. The reason you've been so passionate is you know that I have been convicting you that what you are fighting against is the truth. And every time you go against my church harder, you're just fighting against the conviction. Picture this. My wife and I talked about this yesterday. I thought it was a great truth. Picture what it must have been going through Saul's mind the day Stephen was martyred. I'm not talking about guilt, although it probably was some of that. Saul was very passionate. He led the group out. I mean, Stephen just went into the temple to preach the truth. He was just a deacon preaching the truth, and they just grabbed him and killed him. I mean, that's how much they didn't like it. And they saw it as blasphemy in their minds. Saul standing there holding a coat, like, got this. But if you remember the end of the story of Stephen when he was martyred, at some point, the Bible says that Stephen looked up and his face was like that of an angel. The Bible tells us that he looked up and he saw heaven at a standing ovation as he was being ushered into the presence of God. Now, that's what Stephen saw. Can you imagine what Saul saw? This was not an ordinary persecution. This man did not fight. He did not scream. He didn't complain. He didn't throw stones back. He stood there, allowing all of these things to happen, knowing it was unjust. And he looked up, and there was something about his face that Saul knew. Saul had been fighting. He knew this to be true, but he didn't want to believe it to be true. And so every time he persecuted, Paul, I mean, God is bringing this in. And I wonder if one of the reasons Stephen didn't have that final look was just not to tell Saul, you know, I'm right. And so Saul, just getting more and more. You ever notice this with Christians? I've learned this to be true. This is my opinion, but I've learned this to be true. When Christians backslide, they're often worse than they were before they got saved because they got to fight the Holy Spirit, don't they? When somebody, when you know God's convicting them to be saved, they're like, why? Because there's just internal battle. And God's like, I just love you. By the way, he's not trying to guilt us. He's not trying to make us feel bad. Do you know what he does? He just says, this is the truth. I love you. This is the truth. I love you. That's all it is. And so Saul's listening to this. And finally, Jesus says, you and I both know this has been an ongoing battle for some time now. So I'm just stopping you. Stop fighting me. And so... 
what does Jesus do? He blinds them for the next three days. Why? I don't know. Maybe to make sure Saul could only think and spend time with God. I don't know what the reasons were. We don't have to question God. We just know what he was doing. And then after a while, Saul turns completely around and begins to become Paul, the greatest apostle, the greatest church Christian to have walked the earth. This is an important section of Scripture. It's proof. So I guess the things I see about this when I see Paul or God working on Paul, I see how much it shows God's love for us. God's not angry because we messed up. God didn't come down and get angry at Saul. God came down and said, listen, he wasn't even telling him to stop. He says, you know, I love you and I'm truth. Just listen to me. He didn't get mad at him about the persecution. It shows God's passion for us. He's going to continue to come. It also shows God's willingness to pursue. Aren't you glad the people you're praying for, that God doesn't just offer them salvation once and then quit? He just keeps pursuing. I am. I'm glad that the people I'm praying for will have God's conviction on them until their life is over. You see, you want them to be miserable? I don't think conviction of the Holy Spirit to salvation is miserable. All right, I just hope they realize there's a God who loves them no matter what. That is the great truth, is His willingness to pursue. So let me ask you a question before I move on to the third point. Is God pursuing you today? He could be pursuing you for salvation. Pastor, I grew up in church. That's possible. I'm not asking if you grew up in church. I'm asking, has there been a time in your life when you have been transformed by Jesus? And if not, is he pursuing you? Let me explain a little bit what it will look like. It could be different for you. But right now you're like, God, he's not making you feel guilty. He's just like, this is it. This is the truth. This is what you need to know. This, this, This is what puts all of religion and the confusion aside. Just me. You know that. This answers you like this is clear. This, is, this makes everything so simple. Is God pursuing you to come back to Him in a relationship with Him? He will continue to pursue. Number three, we see His changed life because of Christ. His changed life because of Christ. Go to verse number 16. He says, this is continuing what Jesus says, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this promise, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, and whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. Verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do the works for me to repentance. The first thing the first few verses say here is it changed his direction. He says in these verses, I was going one way, God gave me a mission, and I turned away is what these verses said. He goes, I was sent to the Gentiles. Gentiles is anybody who's not a Jew. So if you're not a Jew, this is who Paul's last, uh, message was to us. To open our eyes, verse 18 says, to turn us from the emptiness and the darkness of the world. I love that description. Because you know what? When we're blinded and we really don't know what's going on, the greatest definition is blindness. You look at the world and what is the world? They're blind. They're running around trying to find answers and all the things they know, but they do it blindly. That's not bad. It's just they don't have. They're doing everything they can with what they've been given And and Satan gives them what little he wants to give them, and it's blindness. And he says, it opens our eyes to the truth. It changed his direction. This was more than just stopping him from his current plan. It was totally changing his direction. You see, we may be going somewhere that ends in misery, and only God knows that. Maybe we don't even know we're headed that way. Maybe we're headed in that direction, and we're clear. We know we need to change, and that's what God's speaking to us. Not only to change his direction, change his purpose. This one probably is one of the greatest aspects of it. See, we could actually say not necessarily to change his purpose, but actually gave him purpose. His initial purpose was to persecute God. Now he becomes zealous and he becomes an advocate for that God. This gave him true eternal purpose. But then number three, it changed his plan. Everything Paul had thought or at that time saw and thought was going to happen had changed. His career, his finances his position in Christ, his position in the world, all changed because of Christ. And it wasn't that he was asked to be miserable. He just said, I've seen truth and nothing in this world matters because I have seen truth. This change was not only to Paul, but ended up, think about it, ended up changing the lives of thousands of people because of this man, Paul. One life being submitted to God, being used of God, changed thousands 
of lives. That's what happened to Paul because he met Christ. Can I tell you that when, we, when you truly come to Christ, you don't have to become religious. You don't have to put on a front and look good and all those things. When you truly come to Christ, you're going to find a relationship with him that makes sense. And I hope you understand, not everybody is going to immediately jump on board and say, this is wonderful. We live in the Northeast. Not everybody's kind about people coming to Christ, right? But they're not kind about other things anyway. Can I tell you? When you come to Christ and you meet a Christ that transforms you, you meet a Christ that loves you no matter what, accepts you as you are with absolute unconditional love, well, you're not going to hear these people mad at you or making fun of you. You're going to hear if they only knew the truth. If they only knew what I now know, their tone would be different. And maybe through what they're saying to you and your response, that might be what opens their door. Last week we talked about that. Our belief is validated by our actions. And maybe that will be what it is. Let's look at number four, his submission to Christ. Verse number 21, Paul continues, For this cause, for these causes, the Jews caught, caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. He says, Because I preach this, they wanted to kill me. Verse 22, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other thing than that those things which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Verse 22, I like it. He says, I've been preaching the truth of the Old Testament, which they claim to believe. I've not changed my point. Verse 23, that Christ should suffer, that he should first be the first that should rise from the dead and show light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. After all that God had been done for Christ in the church, this is where Paul ends up. But Paul wasn't upset. He was simply submissive. I watched a video this week. I started following a guy in line. He's an he's a apologetist. I think that's the way to do it. He works in apologetics and simply defending the faith. I like when I listen to him. His goal is not necessarily to tell people why they're wrong. In fact, most times the, when the videos are popping up, they're asking him questions. And, 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 and someone said, do you believe there's absolute truth? He goes, I absolutely do, depending on who you think. He goes, who is the truth? And, 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 this, and this late guy goes, I don't believe there's absolute truth. And he asked the question, then how do your atheist friends believe that what they're saying is true? They don't have absolute truth. How do they know where they stand is true? It got real quiet in there. But there was a video this week a guy posted of a young man. Actually, it was an older uh, a guy about my age. And they're debating back and forth. And so the guy debating, this guy asking the preacher the question, he said, why, what does it mean to follow God? And the preacher said, well, it's simply to obey the commandments of God, what God has asked us to do. He goes, would you be willing to do that? And the guy on the, on the floor says, well, yeah, I would if I agreed with them. The preacher goes, do you not understand how problematic your comment is? You will follow the commands of a real God if you agree with them? He's missing the main point. I, he was unwilling to submit to the reality. He says, listen, I'll follow God. I'll follow Jesus. I'll do all of this if I agree with Jesus. You, I hope you miss what the point is. He is the God in that scenario. It's humanism. I'm God. What I believe is right. And if this God agrees with me, then I'll follow him. He's asking God to follow him. Salvation does not come because I found a God who agrees with me. Salvation comes because I found a God who is the truth. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, and I come to the God who is truth, and I put away my opinions and my facts and my truth, and I turn and follow the only truth. And this guy's like, I don't think I can do that. You see, what's the answer? The answer is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That'll change him. His eyes need to be opened. More than likely, he's got a lot of negative experiences with religion, and I understand that. I really do. I've witnessed a several who have just got such bad experiences with church and religion, they just say, this is God. And all I can tell them is, that wasn't God. That was a carnal man, or a sinful man, or an unsaved man. You, you, you saw bad religion. You didn't see Jesus. When you find Jesus, you can set aside these little things, and you can begin to see something that is real. Let's look at number five, and we'll be done. His call to accept Christ. Verse number 24. And as he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Here's what he said in verse 24. You're crazy, Paul. None of these things happen. Verse 25. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I'm not drunk. I'm not crazy. I am as clear-headed as I've ever been. 
For the king knoweth of these things, of whom I also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. He goes, this is not something that people didn't know. The whole Jewish community is aware of this. Verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Verse 28, then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Verse 29, and Paul said, I would to God that not, that not only thou, but also all would hear me this day, were both, both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Now, I'm going to take a second and explain verse 28 and 29. For most people, when I've heard this, and I thought this, verse 28, when he says, almost thou persuadest to me to be a Christian, I've always heard it preached as Paul was making a statement. Paul, I've heard you, and I'm almost ready to accept you. It's actually not what Agrippa is saying there. Here's one way you can see this. Look at verse 29. Paul said, I would to God not only thee, but everyone else. Paul's answering a question. So I looked up the tens and set it up. Here's actually what Agrippa is saying. Paul, in this short amount of time, you expect me just to convert right now? Almost thou. In this short amount of time, Paul, you think that I'm just going to change right away? And he goes, yes, I think you should, and everybody listening. That's what Paul said. Yep, I think you should get saved. Please remember, he knew that Agrippa knew all the facts. So he wasn't preaching to Festus. He wasn't preaching to those who wanted him in prison. He was preaching right to Agrippa. Agrippa, you know the facts, and all I'm doing is I'm connecting the Old Testament with Jesus, and you know I'm right. And so Agrippa says, wait a minute, now here's the problem. Agrippa probably was like, you're right, I know the truth. You want me to really do this here? You understand how horrible it would be if I call on Jesus now in the midst of this situation? The political and the rest alone. And Paul's like, yes, you should get saved and everybody listening. Paul had a chance to defend himself. What does he do? He starts a revival. He starts preaching. He's like, I got one more chance. I'm going to heaven at some point anyway. And my one chance is to preach to this king. And he's thinking, if the king gets saved, this could make something big. But it didn't matter. God said, I'm going to preach to kings. When I got here, I'm going to preach to kings. He did not defend himself. He did to an extent by proving to Agrippa that he wasn't wrong. But he was there to preach the truth. His testimony. And here's what he said. He said two things. The call was to everyone. He said, I want everyone to get saved. Not just you, Agrippa. Everybody needs to get saved. Then the call was to receive. It wasn't just to listen. It wasn't just to hear. It wasn't just to know truth. He said, just knowing the truth, Agrippa, is not enough. You need to receive it. I'm going to close with two thoughts, and then we'll be done. Like I promised, I wasn't going to go too crazy long with this. Two thoughts. Number one, do you have, has the truth of Jesus and the truth of heaven and the truth of everything we talked about today, has it moved beyond truth? And has it become real in your life? The Bible says that knowledge puffs up. Just knowing about God won't do anything. Actually, the Bible tells us the devils know about God. They believe and tremble. To know God exists, to know what the Bible says, to say, I believe it, to say, I can't argue with what the pastor says, I believe all of these things, I believe them to be true, that's wonderful, but has there been a time where, you're, where the acknowledging of these truths has moved beyond truth to God, I receive this truth and I make it my own. I call upon you for salvation. Has there been a time in your life when you've done that? I didn't ask you if you joined a church or been baptized, none of those things. The Bible tells us, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you, do you believe what we've said this morning? Do you believe that you are a sinner in need of a Savior? Do you believe that Jesus is the only true God? And if so, are you willing to turn from your sin and put your faith in Him? We'll give you a chance in a little bit to do that. Second question. Remember the time when that happened to you? And don't get me wrong, all of us would say, since the day we've got saved, we've had some really, really good days with Christ and some really, really bad days in our life. You know what I'm talking about. Even the preacher, all right? Uh, we, Christianity is messy. I wish it weren't, but it is. That's why God told us in 1 John, if you confess your sin, he faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what it says, if we confess our sins, you see this is not important, but it is. The word confess is in the present tense. You say, why is that important? It's not past tense one time. Present tense, all the time. Here's what he's saying. If you keep confessing your sins, I will keep forgiving you. 
No matter how many times you sin, no matter how many times you confess, no matter how many times you do that, I will always forgive you. You see, that just doesn't seem right. That's because God doesn't work like we do. God works differently. He's God. And so I'd ask, is there something in your life? You say, Lord, I just need your forgiveness so I can move forward. And then maybe recognize that the power of your testimony, just telling people what Jesus means to you and how he's changed your life, good and bad, good days and bad days. Years ago, a young lady asked me, she was a single mother witnessing to people at her work. And I'll never forget this question. She says, Pastor, every time I tell them about Jesus, they say, look at you, you have a child without a husband. How could you try to tell us to become good? How could you preach to us? The first thing is, that's very religious, all right? I don't know why. This is what they're saying. You're not good enough to tell us why she'd listen to you. Like somehow we need to be perfect to come to Jesus. There's nowhere in Scripture that says that. And so as she came to me, she's, what do I say to them? She's like, I can't witness to them. And I said, yes, you can. You have one of the best tools to witness to them. She says, how? She goes, even with my son whom I love, God still loves me and he still wants to use me. You have the greatest testimony of the grace of God. She's like, oh, she didn't work that day, but she went back to tell her friends the answer to that that day. Because it's true. We don't say, I'm not good enough to witness. Are you transformed enough to tell them about a God who loves you? That's all it needs to be. Now, as we look at this, this is a story. Most of us are familiar with everything we've heard today. But I encourage you, be, allow God to continue to transform you. If you've never been saved, let that today. If, if you've been saved, realize that transformation takes place until Jesus comes back. Let him continue to do the work in your life that he desires to do.